Now we um, were together, of course, early in the year. I'm going to refer to that in just a second. But uh, as Dylan said, at the end, we'll try and save some time for some questions, uh, which I'll be happy to answer as best as I can. I'm going to go through the, this presentation fairly quickly. So uh, if afterwards you think you've missed something, let me know. You can drop me a line and I'll certainly be happy to um, uh, get you the slides afterwards. Uh, there's a few different ways to contact yours truly. Make sure that one way or preferably in a number of ways uh, that you're on our distribution list. Now, what I want to get into first here is the um, uh, fact that earlier in the year, uh, we were together in January and um, talked about the great stagflation. The back then, of course, the uh, uh, scuttlebutt was, uh, is the Fed finally going to start raising interest rates and so forth? And of course, what we ended up with uh, as the year has gone on to now nearly the halfway point is the higher inflation that a lot of us warned about. The Fed belatedly is trying to do something about that. We've got a new energy crisis. We still have supply chain issues. And there's been very little relief in much of that. And of course, last but not least, we do now have that cyclical bear market, although there are some areas like the new fangs that we're going to talk about that have done pretty well. Now, uh, finally, after he was reappointed by President Biden and recently confirmed again by the Senate, Jerome Powell, who has been the Fair Fed chairman for uh, four and a half plus years now or whatever it's been, has gone from being the main arsonist responsible for all of this inflation to now he is Fire Marshal Jay, as I've dubbed him. Some of you remember that great series years ago in Living Color where Jim Carrey got his start and he had that Fire Marshal Bill character, which uh, uh, usually whenever they had a skit, something went badly. Well, we'll see if it does any better for Powell, but I'm not real sure. Uh, in the name of fighting inflation now, he told the uh, Congress last Friday in his semi-annual um, uh, written report to Congress that his fight against inflation, and remember this word, this is going to become as infamous as transitory. His fight against inflation is going to be unconditional. Uh, that means the economy, the stock market, employment eventually be damned if that's what it takes to undo the mess that he chiefly started. Now, one of the consequences of this new cyclical bear market and the revaluation that's been going on and fits and starts on Wall Street, and in a lot of respects worse with this example proving it than what the headline indices are. You know, the S&P down a little over 20%. It got a fair bit back today. Um, a lot of stocks have not done that well. And the old fang stocks, of course, uh, lead the way in that underperformance or terrible performance, I guess you'd say. Uh, here they are on the screen. I don't need to go through the misery any more than some of you may have already experienced if you unfortunately stayed at any of these. But as a group, they are down way more than the stock market generally. And it doesn't mean these companies are going out of business. It doesn't mean that there's anything terribly amiss with them. But it does mean that they are at best mature companies that had become so overvalued with all the money that the Fed had printed for a long time. And now they're going to be relegated to quasi utilities in the years ahead. I don't think we will ever live to see the kinds of valuations, PE ratios and the rest with these things that we did until just the recent months when a lot of them were at their most recent peaks. So the question we need to ask ourselves here is, what comes next? We've had a couple of tastes of this so far this year. I'm going to refer to some of them as we go along, but inevitably we're going to get to a point for whatever reason, and I'll discuss that also a little bit as we move along, where the Fed's current tightening policy, such as it is, must end. It might come the easy way. It might come the hard way. We don't know that yet. Uh, for those of you that are on this uh, a webinar, by the way, you'll be getting as a follow up to this just in the next probably 48 hours. I hope when I get it all finished, a uh, an item that talks about what the markets look like at mid year and and how this whole thing might evolve until we're deep enough into recession that the Fed must stop 
or probably as likely or more that their tightening breaks something in the markets. It's likely not in the U.S., but elsewhere, that will have a ripple effect across the globe, and that'll force their hand. But anyway, as you see here, you know, we, we, we need to ask the question, where will the next stimulus be focused? Uh, where is the next wave of growth going to come from in the economy? What sectors uh, are still cheap, et cetera, et cetera? And the answers to that in my mind and in many others' minds who have followed this for a while is the theme that we call the new fangs. I've talked about a lot of these sectors, but I cannot claim credit for coming up with this specific moniker for these different sectors, folks. That was done by Merrill Lynch back in March. Uh, a lot of other people have glommed onto this. Not enough yet. Uh, the, day, the day will come, possibly some years hence, when the new fangs is all anybody talks about, when uranium stocks and energy stocks and battery metals uh, are being added to the ARK Innovation Fund, et cetera, when they're talked about incessantly on CNBC, and then you'll know that the new fangs <laughs> are over with as a theme, and then we'll have to wait and see what 3.0 is. But there they are, fuels, aerospace and defense, agriculture, nuclear energy, and other forms of renewable energy, and last but not least, gold and other metals. Those are the new fangs. There's been some great performance in some of these already, but you've seen nothing compared to what we're going to see some years down the road. And the reason for this, and I'm going to refer to him later on, uh, Jeff Curry, who is the chief commodity strategist at Goldman Sachs, is one of the smartest people in the, on the planet when it comes to all of these different areas. He's able to articulate this well. If you watch uh, CNBC, especially sometimes Fox Business News, Jeff is on there. And all of these sectors that I've pointed out and that we're going to discuss a little bit have got the same stories behind them. And this is very, very different than what we've seen in the past when there have been times where there have been more so demand driven uh factors that have caused a lot of these commodity prices to go up. The most noteworthy from about 2001 or two through the crash in 2008, China was building the equivalent of the city of Houston about once a month. And that, of course, was the main driver for that huge demand for commodities. But now it's, it's very much a different situation. And almost across the board, it doesn't matter what commodity or substance that we're talking about of the new fangs. There's been years of underdevelopment and underinvestment. Some things are downright scarce. There's some instances you can't even go to the dollar store, some other store these days for your child's birthday party and get helium filled balloons because helium is hard to come by. And we're going to talk about that as one of these many substances in just a minute. Uh, there have been policy errors. There's all kinds of reasons why we are facing years years of chronic shortages. And the only thing that's going to help a little bit, if you really want to sober up about this, folks, is that even if we do have a major bust in the economy, it's only going to give temporary relief when it comes to prices, because this, the things just are not there that we need for a world that has an ever-growing and insatiable demand for energy and food and all different kinds of things. Now, the F, of course, on a new fang stands for fuels. Here's one of the more recent uh, cartoons that my cartoonist Jerry King did for me. Some of you who follow me see these things all the time. But, you know, there we have the president and his treasury secretary, who, as you'll see on my website, nationalinvestor.com, in a recent commentary, I reminded everybody again that the very reason that Janet Yellen has that job as Treasury Secretary was not because merely that she's a Washington retread, not because she was at the Fed once upon a time, not because of her financial bona fides, but because of the fact that she has green bona fides. She's a founding member of the, co the Climate Change Coalition. Uh, she has made a point of using her job as Treasury Secretary as a cudgel to kill financing for the fossil fuel industry. And yet her boss runs around uh, browbeating the oil companies as if it's their fault that they're not drilling. Well, when you penalize that, when you have uh, leases available, but put up so much red tape in the way that it's pointless, uh, when you're telling Wall Street you're going to penalize them and take their ESG brownie points away, if they put a nickel into fossil fuels, it's no wonder 
we don't have the development that we need. We don't have the new refineries that we need, et cetera. So last year, and some of you were, especially who were on my January presentation saw this, uh, I did a piece on the whole green issue, uh, every bit of our energy economy. And we really have seen this year, the revenge of the old economy. We will probably see, uh, unless we have a major new down leg in the market that takes everything with it, we probably will see nominal new record highs for oil. We've only been about 20 bucks away from that. Uh, maybe we've seen the worst of the price increase in gasoline, but what's going to be a rude awakening is that we're not going to see any significant decline in gas prices at the end of the summer, et cetera. One of the things on here, uh, my buddy Phil Flynn, who's one of the best energy analysts I know of, he's Chicago-based, as he's at the Chicago Board of Trade and so forth, he has characterized all of this as a dangerously bullish setup. We could have major shortages still. We, are, we haven't even talked in, in the recent past about what the coming hurricane season might do to make all of this work, let alone what's been done with the war in Ukraine and so forth. And something that's not been discussed at all that we're going to feel come 2023 are the new methane rules that have been enacted already and that go into a force next year that are going to really pull the rug out from under any new fracking in this country and also make continuing development of existing wells that much harder. Uh, as you see here, energy stocks as measured by the XOI uh, have done very, very well for going on two years now. They got hit pretty hard the end of last week. Part of that was margin and forced selling. Part of it was people that were just taking profits belatedly. But uh, look, if, if guys like Phil Flynn, if guys like Jeff Curry are correct, and I think they are, we've only seen the beginnings of what's going to be a multi-year bull market in this area. More interesting still is the oil service stocks, which really have not kept up with the broad sector. There's still a lot of skepticism. There are still a lot of funds that found it fashionable. And you've heard some of this, I'm sure, uh, in recent years. Uh, they all want to disinvest from fossil fuels. We don't want our hands dirty. We're, we're going to be hypocrites. We're going to drive a car. We don't have an electric car yet. We're going to get on airplanes. We're going to heat our home, but we're going to show how virtuous we are and pull our pension funds, pull our endowment funds and so forth out of these kind of companies. We're going to be paying a terrible price for that. We've only seen the beginning of it. And when the light bulb goes off over investors' heads, that that attitude, as well as a lot of other things, have been grossly premature you're going to see a lot of these service stocks too scream higher as they catch up. Moving on, we'll speed it up a little bit to the first A, aerospace and defense. One of many themes about that is rare earths. You've all heard, I'm sure, of the fact that we are still hugely dependent on China primarily, on Russia, on other countries for a lot of different things that we need that are of a critical nature in aerospace and in defense. China leads the world by far and away where rare earth production is concerned. A few of the companies on my recommended list are looking to start putting the pieces together of either U.S. or at least the North American centric supply chain for these kind of things. That's going to be a huge theme going forward. Uh, again, we look anything from drones, titanium. I mentioned helium a minute ago, which is used for guidance systems, for satellites, not to mention for a lot of different kinds of medical equipment and so forth. A lot of these things are specifically for aerospace, but of course go beyond that. Agriculture, even before Russia invaded Ukraine, you've seen a lot of farmers in Europe going bust because of the spike in the price of natural gas. Natural gas is one of the big inputs for fertilizer costs. Now the Ukraine invasion has taken things from bad to worse to now catastrophic. You've got people who are unable to find work, that or helpers rather, who are having to shut down. The, the other input costs, uh, you, you've got, uh, that's a factor. Here's, here's an interesting one I saw the other day. Um, even in Germany now, which is supposed to be the elite economy in the EU, You've got now quotas being put. You can buy one box of pasta, one loaf of bread, one container of flour, et cetera. Fertilizer 
prices, again, as I pointed out, have gone through the roof. So we are facing, and, and we're fortunate, I guess, in relative terms in the U.S., it's less bad. I'm more fortunate here in Florida that we've got a, a better food economy and food chain for that economy than a lot of the rest of the country. But I'll tell you what, you're going to start seeing, especially in the developing world in Africa, parts of uh, the, the developing Asia, they're not going to have a lot of food come the end of this year. It's not going to be a good situation. Moving on to N, nuclear energy. Uh, I have been saying for about a year and a half, and I will tell you again that there is not a single commodity that you can be investing in right now that has got a better supply demand setup than does uranium. Uh, of everything else that the Biden administration has touched, and in my case, in my opinion, done damage to, at least they're getting on the same page with the rest of the world when it comes to the renaissance of nuclear energy. And another cartoon here you see, you know, I've commented in the past that from time to time, when the gold sector catches fire, the generalist investors, most people who don't care about gold until all of a sudden it gets popular, it's like a 300 pound man jumping into a kitty sized wading pool. When these kind of things take off, it's going to be like an elephant jumping into a kitty sized wading pool. We've seen a few tastes of this already. Uh, but uh, again, nothing in my opinion, like what's going to come down the road. And here again, folks, this is very much a story of underinvestment, years of a bear market for uranium, your nuclear energy being out of favor. Now that's starting to flip around and there is not the uranium that, that will remotely begin to meet the needs going forward uh, as this whole part of the uh, world's energy mixes build out. And, and in case you didn't know the statistic, uh, one out of five homes in this country is supplied by nuclear power. This is a slide from a recent uh, presentation by Chemical, one of the uranium giants that talks about uh, the setup. And again, what they see is the best ever fundamentals that, that they can remember. The setup here is just incredible. One of the other things I'll have quickly following this presentation and the days to come before I head up north for a belated summer trip to visit my family, uh, get out of the heat in Florida to the heat, I guess, in Wisconsin, not much difference in the last few days. But I will have something specific on uranium that goes into a lot more detail that you're really going to want to look at. Uh, the Biden administration recently finally is looking at putting some teeth to the promises that started uh, in the Trump administration. And now they are car carrying forward to reinvigorate the domestic energy industry, which has pretty much been in the doldrums for quite a while. Uh, but here again, even though it has, uranium stocks generally have already done extremely well. Here's a, a chart of Uranium Energy Corporation, probably the biggest such company that has a, a U.S. focus and is not producing anything, but could be producing a lot soon if all goes well. And here you can see its share price as low as about 40 or 50 cents a share. Back a couple of years ago, it was recently around six bucks. It uh, was about 350 or 360 today. But again, these kind of stories uh, have not even begun to move. Finally, the G at the end of the new fangs stands for gold and other metals. Of course, gold has always been a story of the erosion of fiat currencies. It has not done as well in the recent past as some of the battery metals did for a while, as, as oil and gas did and so forth, because until this year, for the most part, the Fed's inflation was driving up the values of so many other things, whether it was cryptocurrency, stocks and whatnot, that gold was an also ran but it's done better in relative terms this year. As you see here, you know, commodities generally have led the pack, but gold has at least held its own this year when a lot of other things have been going down. And let me tell you something, we may not have seen the final bottom for gold yet. When I told people not long after that recent move above $2,000 an ounce in March that we needed to get out of our trading positions, I said that we've got 1850 to look at as a potential for a bottom, and after that, the 1750 to 1775 an ounce. We almost got to that ladder recently. We may flutter down to it still, but I'll tell you what, if and when we do, and especially when something inevitably causes the Fed to stop or slow down its tightening, that will be your backup to truck time for gold. When it comes to the battery metals and other minerals, same story I've mentioned a couple of times already. You remember the story of when Charlton Heston got the Pharaoh upset and he said, all right, I'll fix you. I'm not going to give you any 
straw to make your bricks, but your tally of bricks shall not diminish. Well, Pharaoh Biden, uh, even though he recently invoked the Defense Production Act, has got an interior secretary that is against almost any development in this country of these kind of battery metals. And I, if we had time today, I could rattle off numerous projects in the U.S. with massive stores of copper, nickel, cobalt, platinum group metals, et cetera, that have either been slowed down or dead stopped by this administration. It's as if they think Elon Musk and GM and Ford and Volkswagen all have magic extrusion machines that magically spits out electric vehicles. They don't. And that's one of the reasons why we're at the beginning of a new energy crisis, because they've hobbled the old energy economy and have also hindered the development of the one that they claim they want. Going forward, one of the things I'll be looking at is what I've called the new, the new Monroe Doctrine, just as we have new fangs. We need to stop worrying about what goes on in the rest of the world, get out of this proxy war with Russia, which has caused these problems to become magnified which has accelerated the move away from the U.S. influence in the world. It has driven up costs of commodities. We need to look to our own backyard again, Canada, Mexico, South America. Do not further allow China to have incursions and take these resources in our hemisphere, as well as others. This is a major policy thing, folks, that if we were to do it right down the road, we would have the substances we need for a green economy. But right now, we don't. Again, as I said, in summing this up, as we as we get to end here, Jeff Curry has pointed out that you know this is a multi-year secular bull market for commodities. And again, not because of shortages or temporary political things like the Arab oil embargo of 1973, but these are structural, these are intractable. Uh, policymakers in the US, Europe, and elsewhere have made things worse than they already were. We're going to pay a terrible price. And the question is, at what point does a light bulb go off over policymakers' heads? Or we change the people in charge to figure out, hey, we need to catch up and do it fast. One interesting presentation I was on last week was put on by a group called the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, during the Trump years, we were promised infrastructure spending, never really got it. There's been some modest moves by Biden that Congress signed on to, but these things are a pimple on a flea compared to what is needed. Canada has an infrastructure bank. China has got two. Europe has got one, although it's relatively meaningless. We don't have one. And I'll tell you what, down the road, when policymakers finally figure out what we need for good jobs to rebuild our infrastructure, to build the green economy, to rebuild what needs to be rebuilt, et cetera, uh, that is where future stimulus measures are going to be focused when the point comes that the Fed has to reverse course again, and it will, and print more money. They will never again politically get away with just printing up money to, so that people on Wall Street can make money. There's going to have to be a game plan that has societal benefits attached to the next wave of credit expansion. This is going to be it. And this is why I am very bullish on this whole theme of the new fangs. Some rocky times to go through first as we move into a recession, maybe worse if the Fed overdoes things, but down the road, these are going to be winning themes. So again, to get the slides from this, if you like, uh, let me know. Uh, email me, chris at nationalinvestor.com. If you'd like the slides, if you have any questions that we don't get to right now, starting with uh, the first one from Dylan. The first question we have is, how badly did we shoot ourselves in the foot putting the Taliban in charge? Putting who in charge? I missed that. The Taliban, the referencing uh, what recently transpired in Afghanistan. Well, it wouldn't have been as bad if, again, we would embrace this Monroe Doctrine again. We shouldn't have to be worrying about uh, Afghanistan stores of rare earths and so forth going to China, going to Russia or whoever. The sad thing is, at this point, the Biden administration's actions are keeping us dependent as we're trying to limp our way to building electric vehicles on rare earths and other things from other parts of the world. It doesn't have to be that way. So the bigger sin, in my opinion, is not that the, the Taliban's uh, control of rare earths and so forth is now going to go to China or Russia. It's that we aren't even developing what we have in this country and we're letting other resources 
uh, go to China, even in our own backyard in South America. That's the bigger problem. Thank you so much for that. Next question we have here is, what is your view on bulk transportation stocks like Dyna Shipping, Star Bulk, Golden Ocean, and Zim? I think a lot of them have already had good moves that might be getting a little bit late because there's been some rebound already in, um, in the Baltic Freight Index, for example, which spiked way up. It's fluttered back down again recently as recession fears are coming. I'll tell you one of the themes I, I like down the road. And look, I think these are going to be good long-term stories as well, because again, they're, they're going to be necessary vessels to, to move these different things. But looking closer to home, I think that hydrogen powered mass transit in the US and, and elsewhere in North America, the bigger cities in Canada, that's a theme that doesn't get a lot of attention. I think that high speed rail is something that doesn't get a lot of attention. So those things closer to home, I think are gonna have some traction. Don't forget too, on that subject that with all of these new global carbon taxes set to go into effect and to get more onerous as time comes in, you don't necessarily want things in the first place shipped from halfway around the world because that's going to increase costs. Why in the US, for example, do we want a, a Ford or a Tesla or a GM to be importing nickel from Indonesia with massive carbon taxes because of the distance and transportation and because of the way that nickel is mined when we have nickel right here in the good old US of A or up in Canada? Thank you so much for that. Speaking of commodities, can you recommend a commodity ETF? Well, I'll tell you, I think uh, as far as energy is concerned, uh, the XOI, the OIH, uh, the ETFs that focus on those are good ones. Some broad commodity ETFs. I hesitate and I'll tell you why. Um, with resource extraction, there's a lot of risk. Uh, there's, it's not a one size fits all deal with producers. And what typically happens is that you end up, you know, getting an index and 20% of the companies in the index are great performers. The other 80% are rather so, so, so you really kind of water down your returns. What I do is kind of a two-step thing. And I'm going to use gold, if I may, as a quick example, I'll look at individual companies that I think are superior exploration stories. I'll tell people to buy them and we don't try and time the market with those things. But when I think that the gold as a sector is doing well, then I will get into some of the broader uh, sector plays that are like the ETFs, but sometimes the leveraged ones uh, I, would, I would choose. You know, in, in oil, for example, switching back to that, check out uh, ERX and ERY. If you're a trader, those are opposite numbers from one another. ERX is the bullish one. The ERY is a bearish one. Those are more leveraged ETFs on energy stock. But there's a lot of them out there. But I, I think that the better money long term is if you roll up your sleeves, as I do, and show people how to do as an investor, I, I'd rather pick off individual companies. That's my, that's my first preference. Thank you so much for that. Our next question here is, do you think the market will go down again in July after the Fed rate increase? Well, I think that that's already baked into the cake. I think that what's going to cause the market to have another leg down ultimately here is going to be when reality sets in and companies are going to have to come out and admit that, hey, you know, the, the, our PE ratios are not going to be what we thought because the E is shrinking a little bit. You know, we've had a reasonable repricing of the stock market already, but it really hasn't contemplated yet that earnings are going to get hit. Uh, there's this belief, this smugness that some people still have that inflation is going to go away sooner rather than later. It is not for most things. So I think that what's going to hurt later on is that as earnings estimates get hit, you're going to see the, the worst offenders there, the ones that have got the least ability to, to pass on costs, get hit anew. Look, I think in percentage terms from top to bottom, we've probably endured half or more of the overall cyclical bear market, but that still means we might have 10 to 15% downside for the S&P 500, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, for the NASDAQ, we could still drop another 30% even from where we are right now. But the fun thing is, as I've demonstrated with a few of these sectors uh, in this presentation, and this, this is what happened in, in the 2000 to 2002 bear market. Halfway through, the market was still dropping, but entire sectors, housing, real estate, uh, investment trusts, commodities were all going up. So, 
but I, I do think that the that the bottom final bottom for the cyclical bear market we're in is still a ways away. Thank you so much for that. Last question we have here is with the difference in generational priorities, do you believe that there will be some kind of a revolt or pushback in the EV and carbon neutral initiative? I, I don't know if I'd call it a revolt or a pushback. I, I, I think, look, I think a lot of people want to believe that we can clean up this planet, that we can emit less carbon. This is a profligate nation in many ways. We have 5% of the world's population. We use 25% of the world's energy resources. So there needs to be sustainability brought into this as well. You know, we wouldn't be having this angst right now, Dylan and, and folks, if it wasn't for the fact that the planning to go into this energy transition has been somewhere between horrid and deliberately destructive. So I think that, uh, you know, when people are paying 10 bucks for gas, when we're no nearer to mass roll out of EVs and we are right now, that's going to cause a revolt. And it won't just be one generation. It'll be everybody, I hope. Well, as a 24-year-old, I am definitely feeling the burn these days. I'm sure. So with that, we are going to have to conclude this presentation. Once again, I would like to thank our speaker, Chris Temple, for joining us and all of our Money Show attendees. Our next presentation will be starting shortly. <laughs>